Welcome, Spartans, to the Podcast Evolved Book Club. I am your host, Aaron. With me this week, we have David. Hello, everybody. And we've got Krista. Hi. I say this week, we should probably say, like, this month, shouldn't we? It is. It's it's a monthly series, not a weekly series. That would be a lot of reading if it was a weekly series. Oh, Jesus, could you imagine? We could do it chapter by chapter and just, like, kill off the audience. That might work. Mission debrief. We have to start with the cold protocol, so it's like like a seventy-nine part episode. One chapter a week. We'll be finished by the time of the battle on Installation Zero Four. That should work. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, anyway, you've joined us this week because, or this month, because we are covering the rather awesome book Silent Storm. Only just came out, so like we're on time with this one. We're actually small spoiler for anyone that listens to this later. We are so early with this book club that the Halopedia hasn't even finished their entries yet. This is how good we are. <laughs> Maybe they'll yes, quote us in their it. entries. Yes, because I went to go check some character names earlier, and I found out none of them had any entries. So I that had is to why do it the I write them down way. as I go. Not as easy when you're listening to the audiobook and driving. I've I've Ooh, discovered that's the true. one flaw of audiobooks. Just make an Alexa list. Just yell at your Alexa. Might do that. Okay, right, we'll get the details out of the way first here. The author of this uh, brilliant book is Troy Denning, who brought you uh, previous books such as Last Light and Halo Retribution. It's published by Simon & Schuster. It's available in physical e- and audiobooks. It was released on September 4th except that wasn't the case here in the UK because it released slightly later, but I don't remember the date. Mm-hmm. And it's approximately 400 pages depending on how zoomed in you are in your ebook. I think the <laughs> physical book is 382. There you go. You nailed it. And I think it's about 14 hours in audiobook form, give or take. David, do you want to give us the synopsis before we start jumping in here? I will indeed. It's a pretty cool synopsis. Um, so we've got we got the synopsis a while back. I think Jeff gave it to us in one of his um, Halo Silent Storm first look. Um, so we've kind of known the, the, the setup for this book for some time. Here we go. It has been almost a year since humanity engaged in its destructive first contact with a theocratic military alliance of alien races known as the Covenant. Now the hostilities have led to open war and the United Nations Space Command understands virtually nothing about its new enemy. There are only two certainties. The Covenant is determined to eradicate humanity, and they have the superior technology to do just that. The UNSC's only hope lies with the Spartans, enhanced super soldiers trained from childhood via a clandestine black ops project to be living weapons. Their designated commander, Petty Officer John 117, has been assigned to lead Spartans on a desperate counterattack designed to rock the Covenant back on its heels and buy humanity the time it needs to gather intelligence and prepare its defences. But not everyone wants the Spartans to succeed. A coalition of human rebel leaders believes an alliance with the Covenant to be the best hope of finally winning the independence from the United Earth government. To further their plans, the insurrectionists have dispatched a sleeper agent to sabotage UNSC counterattack and ensure that John 17 and the Spartans never return from battle. So I actually forgot about that second paragraph, all about the Spartans being the other element to this as being the insurrectionist. I didn't know this book would be in, as insurrectionist heavy as it is, and I really like it for that. It's good. They do a lot of cool stuff with us. So I think the only other thing to cover before we dive in here is because we're the lower people. This takes place in the year 2526. I believe the majority of it takes place in March if I'm remembering right from my audio you book. Are. So if you're keeping a track yeah, in the timeline, you know when we are. And the three main locations, while we're chatting about this, just so you know, are uh, the book opens in Netherop. It moves to Pico and this last place... Zoist? Zoist? Zoist. Zoist. That's how they pronounce it. Zoist? In the audio book, they pronounce it Zoist. It took me a Thanks second, but silent. I got there. I think the ba- the way we're going to do this, rather than uh, run through it in a blow-by-blow, blow, oh. I've split it up into... Oh, hang on, Krista's got something. One last timeline thing, just for reference. This is a little over a year after first contact at Harvest. Oh yeah, good point. Just to have something to reference. Yeah, this is this is very early days. The poor old Spartans haven't really been in operation too long yet. <laughs> right, so the way we're going to do this, I have kind of split the book up into... A couple of chunks and we're just going to chat about them because I think they kind of cover everything and then we'll uh, drop in our bits and stuff we liked along the way. So the book opens with a Spartan boarding action of a Covenant ship in orbit around planet Netherop 
and this is a uh, it takes its inspiration from the first attack the Spartans made on a Covenant ship when they lost Sam where they just boarded the ship by themselves with some weapons and nuked it on the inside and they're now trying to use this tactic to capture a Covenant ship. They spend an awful lot of time trying to capture Covenant ships. That's kind of what this book is about. <laughs> it's kind of what a lot of them are about. I really like the setup to this, more so than I thought I would in terms of when they first announced the book and it said it's John-centric, everyone was like, hell yeah, haven't had one in like 10 years, ready for a John book. Then they gave us the year. And I was like, oh man, it's a prequel book. Damn it. But I was not expecting how much or how quickly I got into this book. How much, because I just really didn't think about, okay, it's a prequel book. What does that mean? Sitting in a year after Harvest, what does that mean? Is that they don't know anything and they spend the whole time figuring stuff out in this book, which I love. I love how John comes up with all of the names for the things that we take for granted. I loved that. Designate elites. Yeah, designate as elites. Designate this ship that hovers. It's kind of ghost-like. That's a ghost. I was like, oh, that's cool. Hingeheads, I think is it Kelly comes up with the term hingeheads. And he's like, what the hell is a hingehead? No, it's an elite. And you're like, nope, hingeheads yeah. definitely stuck <laughs> for years after that. I love that, that that was the slang. But I, I do love that he was officially designating stuff as like, so he actually meets it for first contact in terms of like, then it became official. And that's what everyone called it. Yeah. I just loved how he was... He was doing that. He was on the front lines discovering things. The thing I really like about this like opening couple of chapters when they're doing this board in action is you immediately see when he's talking to Ascot. Wasn't it Ascot still in charge of the ship there? Yes. And he's trying to negotiate to get her to let him go on the mission because Spartans aren't superheroes yet. And she's like, no, 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 no. You guys could really, really die. And like any any other time in a Halo book when we meet someone and a Spartan says, oh, just let me off the ship here. You know, anyone would turn around and go, certainly, no problem, Master Chief, away you go. That was <laughs> something, yeah, I definitely wasn't ready for, was the fact that the Spartans were just totally not trusted, totally not like integrated well, that this was their first real kind of like joint operations and that their history they don't have a history yet with like the various factions of the human military the military wanted to underutilize them they didn't know exactly how to work with them yeah well there's politics involved as well like oh my gosh all of the politics and john's just sitting there super angry the entire time it was great uh i was just gonna say every case is in all media there is boarding actions are always cool i mm -hmm. love boarding actions so like i'm down with this intro setting i thought it was really quick I love the idea. The concept makes sense. We know we've, they've done it before. I like the idea of the UNSC figuring out, like, we can't win the way we normally, the way we, we can't fight like them. We have to do something new. I love the whole premise that that's what this book is doing and what, and what, what the whole setting of it is. I love that. I love that. It's cool. I thought I thought um, the boarding action for the um, initial chapter was really interesting because it was very action-y. But also you kind of get a sense of where we are in the story because they don't know who elites are. They don't know who drones are. They're still learning about that. So I think it really was, it was able to get you into the timeline by highlighting the stuff that they don't know yet. The book was very good at doing that the whole way out in terms of like stuff we take for granted in Halo. Them not knowing it, like not knowing what they're going to find on a ship. Is it breathable? not being 100% sure that they could breathe inside the ship. So I thought that was really cool. Not knowing where the bridge is. Yeah, yeah that's true. And they lean back into the space stuff as well, which I like. Like they're they're concerned yeah. about orbits and orbital mechanics and how they're going to drift into the ships and things. Like things like that that I would never have thought about is like, of course the Banshees have to float around in the right orbit to redock with the, the mothership and they don't just fly straight up and into it. And that's how the Spartans drift in and get into the back of it. Actually, coolest thing about the Covenant ships, I can't remember which model of ship it is, but when they talk about how you get out of the hangar bay and you walk up the curved tail and you basically walk up the outside of the hull until the corridor rotates 180 and then you walk the right way up for the rest of the ship. That was crazy. That was really crazy. Because I didn't even think about that when looking at Co Covenant ships. No, I, d I suppose it never really made sense to me either. Is if the ship curves back like that, there's not going to be like a stairwell to get you up and around the bend. So you had to get up and around somehow. Things like that were cool. 
So I think the only other thing to say about this first section is, unfortunately, they don't manage to capture this ship. The elite captain self-destructs in the end. And unfortunately, the Spartans, well, they do get away, but they don't get their nice new toy that they want. Yeah. Oh, sh also we should mention here that so far in the book, you don't realize what's happening yet. But there's a fuck up from one of the Prowler crews who uh, blew the Spartans cover because... I think the Spartans make it to the main section of the ship through the hangar bay without an alarm being raised yet. Like, they get quite far into the ship. I think they were right before the bridge, weren't they? They were at the main body of the ship. They were about to go through, like, I think it's the choke point where John was afraid that they would get locked in the rear of the ship. So they were just about to move in through that door whenever their cover's blown. And at this point in this, the book, like, you don't know, you don't think there's anything more to this, but it gets a bit sinister as we go later on. Yeah, I did like the callback later on. Yeah, so we go from there to what's basically the setup for this book, which is we join Sergeant Johnson, and he's on Yay. the, yep, he's on the UNSC Everest, and if you think that name sounds familiar, that's because it happens to be the flagship of a certain Admiral Cole. I was so happy with all of the characters they integrated into this. Big time. There's some big heavy hitters in this, and I was impressed, shocked, and was not expecting at all to have as much Johnson or as big a character as it is. But it makes total sense to have him in here. They had a lot of it, Halsey, too. Yeah, way more Halsey than I expected, and I liked... I like the dynamics. I liked Halsey. I liked the Spartans. I liked Johnson. I like how he integrated with them. I liked his purpose. I thought it was really clever and really well taught and makes perfect sense and really, really, really actually nicely ties in to Halo 2 when Johnson and Master Chief are really familiar and really friendly for when you think about no reason whatsoever um, other than First Strike. It's cool. I, I, li I like that their history is built up over the years. We didn't really know much about chief and johnson interacting other than um first strike really yeah and even then I, I need to go back and read that but i i don't know how friendly they were or professional as opposed to in this one there's very much a, he mentor. Was a mentor yeah yeah big time and i thought i really i liked that he was very politically savvy and that that was he was great in terms in for for john who obviously just sitting there not really getting and just being frustrated about what's happening and that Johnson was able to break it down for him. Thought that was cool. And break it down for me. Because, you know, politics. Is I have to admit that he does it quite... He, he does, like, the extra characters quite well. Because the first time I listened to this, I started to get worried about the time Cole and Stanforth and Johnson appear. And I'm like, oh no, this is, this is going to be small Halo universe all over again. Where everyone knows everyone and everyone's being together. But... With the exception of one or two people later on that I don't think necessarily needed to be in this, I think he, they do a pretty good Ooh. job with. I will get into it later, but there are there's a there's a brute pair that I think were unnecessarily oh. name dropped. Yes, yes, I yeah. get it. Yeah, I think think so too. I, I think they're the worst case of small Halo universe in this. But right, well, we can run through this fairly quick. You have a. Uh, when Sergeant Johnson comes aboard, it's uh, Admiral Cole, Admiral Stanforth, who we haven't seen in a while, who's also a very good character, and Dr. Halsey on the Everest, and they have a chat with Johnson where I love when Johnson first walks into the room and he sits down at the desk and Stanforth and Cole are kind of arguing with Halsey at the desk and Johnson's sitting there with his inner monologue and being like, what the fuck am I doing here? Yeah. <laughs> I do love that. First, like, he gets off the lift and he's only just been popped out of the cryo tube and he's like, why am I here? What's going on? And then the lift stops at this level and he's like, he assumes someone's getting on and he's not getting off. So he jumps back into the corner of the lift out of the way. And then they're like, no, 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 you're supposed to be here. And he's still completely confused the whole time because while they're chatting about this operation that they're planning, Johnson keeps going like, what are we talking about? What operation? Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? And Stanforth keeps going like, we haven't decided anything. We're just chatting at the minute. And he keeps like, what are you talking about? The whole time this goes on. I love that he's straight out of the cryo tube. Absolutely wrecked. Instantly starts flirting. I'm like, yes. Get in there, Johnson. Oh, yeah. I like that. I like he's straight into himself. 
I liked his assessment of Halsey, not knowing her, but like how he reads the room. I thought it was really cool. I thought it was well written of like the dynamics between these admirals and a civilian. But yet, she's just so overbearing that she like takes over the room and that, you know, she doesn't speak to these admirals like they're admirals. I thought I liked that. Troy captured the essence of each character very well, I think. Cole has a pretty small part in this, but um, yeah. he's an important character. He is. Like, I suppose it's kind of cool to have him mentioned, but you don't get too much out of him. One cool thing I like out of this is when they're having the conversation with Johnson about what he thinks of the Covenant, and he basically sums it up as great technology, crap soldiers. And yeah. it really yeah. comes into it later in the story when we we'll, we get to like the final sections, but it really is true the further on you go that they're not the greatest soldiers in the world. They might be good warriors, but humanity churns out better soldiers well they're just overconfident i feel at this point majorly so and i like that i liked i mean we they've always said that i think even harvest contact harvest always said and or there was something said i think it was probably about harvest that about like when looking at the covenant human war it was always we were screwed in space did really well on the ground but so much is determined by space that we never really felt the effectiveness where we could that's why i liked I think we should talk about what the mission is now, um, because I liked this mission. I like I said, I like the idea of creating their own tactics, their own kind of guerrilla warfare style, some uh, something they haven't haven't heard of, and I think adapted to well. It was pretty cool. So the mission being, they have, they're going, they're creating this Uber Task Force, uh, Task Force Yama, Task Force Yama, and it's just it's so awesome. It's composition. It's just like my brain is like fuck yeah, that sounds so cool, like. It is. It's made up of what is it? It's yeah, a fleet of prowlers, the the black daggers, who are probably Super the coolest cool. unit. But even the the numbers just staggered me. And like four hundred ODSTs. Oh, I think it's eight hundred. Yes, it's something like eight hundred. It's a ridiculous, a ridiculous number of ODST troopers. And I, my brain is like, holy shit! I've seen troopers. 30 strong when they talk about it in other books it's always an elite unit small when even when it's mass drops i think even the mission for odst i think was a couple of hundred maybe but i'm like 800 troopers yeah and like these are and these aren't just regular odsts like these are the best of the best until the spartans came along the black daggers are like the the top-notch soldiers in the unsc yeah plus full three teams of spartans so you got blue gold and green team which i know are kind of loose but and there's a lot of one thing i, di- I didn't like is there's a lot of silent spartans in this um there's a few names that are touched upon which i liked but for the most part a lot of the other spartans don't get any book time or any kind of screen time i suppose it's mostly centered around blue team really really yeah. is and i know it is a it is a john book and i suppose we have asked for this so i'm not really i can't really complain that much i was just no. like okay when you give me so many spartans that we don't know anything else about or very little about they're just mentioned and offhand and away doing things. I'm like, oh man, I want to see these characters. I want to see these personalities. I get, I get the feeling or I wonder, do they name drop them in preparation for stuff down the line? I feel like you don't give three teams of Spartans full names of all their members unless you're going to do something with them later. Yeah. I would say so. And even just given Troy's previous workings in terms of he's, he does not, he's not done standalones. He's done a series. He has like what we've called his mini trilogy. Do you know what I mean? Which are unique, great characters. And he handled some of Blue Team very well. So obviously he's familiar with Fred uh, and Linda and Kelly. Do you know what I mean? So I'm pretty happy with that. And yeah. I, I, I can absolutely see him doing more, something else coming out of this book, which we'll talk about at the end. I will say as well, Prowlers to me were small, small ships. Two-man crews. I'm looking up at my Halo War fleet right now because there were two two crews and 10 passengers thereabouts and i think in glasslands it's a small they're small designated ships as well i always got the impression they were very small kind of ships like about that size 10 15 maybe 20 people max in this book it introduced two cl- new classes of prowlers which we haven't had before and there's so many and they sound they're way bigger than i thought that in terms of their sizes and there's a statement in halo warfleet which i never clicked on right now but it, it has the UNSC style Corvette Winter Class, which is the ship you kind of would see. It's the newest kind. You, I think you see it in Halo 5 when Blue Team take a prowler at the end of midnight, I think it is, from the midnight. It says, smaller and more compact than most prowlers, which I never dawned on me, means that there's obviously a shit 
more other kind of prowlers that are way bigger but that are stealth ships and that's really goddamn cool the thing i thought about was they do have bigger stealth ships because they eventually started to do things like the stealth frigate uh in cold protocol the name of it escapes me right now but like that i remember don't remember it remember captain keys no, it's the Captain Key ship that smaller. they take out. You know, because they get caught oh, I do. because the core overloads and they have to vent the heat out the back. And it yeah, like basically. Right, that ship, that ship, yeah. But like that was their attempt at putting a regular naval ship in stealth. So they've obviously that, at that, that point, a, yeah, that wasn't a prowler though. No, that but at that no, point they'd obviously they'd experimented with it before. So I kind of figured they had to have other ships. And then I think the the ship from the kilo 5 trilogy i can't remember its name either it's a stealth frigate of some description i got the impression it was smaller because they said it was a big ship but it was modified to be crewed by less but i think it basically it was just more automated with bb i yeah. i think it was still okay. a crew for a couple of hundred but there was no no you know, way it was that big i think it was that big hundred? i got I the impression it was again. smaller in the kilo 5 trilogy Definitely. If it was operated by that small of a crew, they, they wouldn't be hundreds. That's just, that's crazy. That's like the Enterprise with like 10 people in it. Yeah, because I think they kind of like, they hint at it time and again that Osman, you know, if she didn't know where the crew was, she might never bump into anyone when she was on the ship. Because it was just, it was I big. Yeah, right, but like I it wasn't colossally big, but it was big enough to hold a couple of pelicans and Covenant dropships. And... It had two pelicans, if I remember. I think it was big enough, but anyway, uh, we're getting a little sidetracked. Uh, I don't think, did we actually say, the gist of the Task Force Yama's mission was to go behind Covenant lines and take out Covenant ships, as many as they could. Yeah, they were capturing, it was all about asset. I I like that, I like a lot that they were all getting in, destroying, capturing. Their their directives are to grab equipment, grab weapons, anything they could think of. I I love that element of information gathering, I love that basic idea is to cause enough disruption behind covenant lines to slow the covenant advance down because when cole and that are talking about it like when cole's arguing with halsey at one stage she's talking about how it'll take her a year to understand the technology and cole's of the opinion the unsc probably won't be around in a year like you can really tell he's he's super nervous because she's like uh, wars aren't won or lost in a year and he's like we might not be around in a year so this mm. is like it's a desperate i think at one point down the line some another character we'll mention later says that this is exactly the kind of plan preston would come up with with his back up against the wall and like it really seems to be a kind of desperate move where we're sending these prowlers and all these soldiers behind enemy lines to fling spartans out of ships like torpedoes to blow up <laughs> covenant I love ships that. well and also this is a suicide mission they go out they're not te- they don't really they don't they don't paint it as a suicide mission but going behind enemy lines and being shot into an enemy vessel with the hopes of blowing it up from inside is basically a suicide mission for anyone that's involved they always played it really good it's not like they did a really good job of once we're inside we're just detonating and getting out so they're not trying to get to an engine core or fight their way into a ship they're literally in the hangar as soon as they get there dropping their bombs and jumping out out the hangar again so and there's a lot of um you know eva in this and a lot of being picked up just left floating in space and will pick you up afterwards so suicide yes but i think they, they had a fairly solid exit strategy for some of this stuff but oh spartans always have an exit strategy strategy I, <laughs> it's just part of that I, I loved how they didn't know anything they don't know anything about the covenant but they they logically thought through what it took to manage a size of a force that big that regardless of your alien human whatever you are there is you need to have xyz and that that's like that has to be true that if you're operating this far, you're assuming away from your home. You need a logistic train. You need support. You need this. You need that. I love that idea. I love how they just figured that out. That if we were doing this, we would need this. So they must need it too. So logically, we if we need to go here and we'll find X. And they did. And that worked. And I thought that was cool. I love how they figured out where they were going next. And how they logically thought that through. And came up with a plan to ambush them in the next place. Which was Soba? Sobia? Sioba. 
Just before we go into Subo, do we want to touch briefly in the training with the Black Daggers and the Spartans? Because this is where we're introduced to probably the best character, I think, in this whole book is uh, Colonel Crowther. And he's yes. the leader of the Black Daggers. He does not give two shits about the Spartans or John and his Black Daggers are great. We do find out very quickly why he doesn't give two shits about the Spartans. It's because he figures out that the Spartans' ages on their files are wrong and they've been changed in doctors. And I Spartans like how he 15. figures it out. Yeah, he because everyone thinks they're 19 and he's like... No, if you're going to change your dates on your records, you need to change the dates on the payroll because you've yeah. been getting paid for eight years. And I think, like, oh, what does he say? Like, you've either been in training since you're 11 or your your ages are wrong. And John's like, oh, that's so far off the mark. <laughs> yeah, John trying to be coy was pretty funny. Yeah, and, like, they, they're training with the Black Daggers, but what they don't actually realise while John's training in different zero g maneuvers is the black daggers are using the spartans as their stand-in for the covenant and they're training against them as this overwhelming force and it isn't until i think the spartans hold their own up until johnson takes charge and johnson yeah. Yeah. just mops the floor with them because it's a strategy john never thought of where he just throws odsts at them i think at one stage they say because they use the same it's the same sort of paintball rounds you see in Forward Under the Dawn where it locks tack up rounds? your armor. Yeah, the tack rounds. Yeah. So at one point he says, like, the training space is so full of armor locked ODSTs that no one can move. Because <laughs> yeah. Johnson just keeps stuffing them in through the airlocks because his strategy is I'll spend 20 ODSTs to take out one Spartan. I think at one stage they say that uh, there's one sniper keeps taking shots at Kelly from a fixed position and the second Kelly shoots back another dozen snipers that have been hidden the entire time take her out and they do things like this over and over and John's getting more and more pissed off. Well and John also says that you know this kind of strategy wouldn't actually work in battle it would be too many casualties but for the training mission it makes sense but he also thought it was kind of cheating because it's not it's not a strategy that you would actually use on the battlefield. He got he got very salty. He was very mad. True. Well, he did kind of think that, but then again, I suppose like he was proven wrong at at least one stage because the Covenant used that strategy against him when he boards the ship before. Because when they're stuck in the gravity lift at the start, and he's like, the only thing he didn't expect the Covenant to do was to open the top of the gravity lift and attack him. Yeah. I think at one stage he's like, the Covenant do a face on a, f- a frontal attack with him, and he's like, this is not what we expected them to do. So I, I suppose Johnson definitely has a much better grasp of what it's going to take than the Spartans initially do, which I suppose makes sense and why Johnson's there, because he was the first person to fight the Covenant, and he fought them off, as he says, with a group of half-trained civilians basically so we go on from that and then we go to we eventually work out that the covenant are going to attack the planet Biko because either i think they say either they skip past it and they leave a base behind their their own lines or they take it and use it as their own staging area but either way they're probably going to attack Biko so they have to either destroy it or use it and that's yeah, yeah. so they theorize that it have to be there so i think it's here where the kind of the insurrection kind of pops its head yeah. So yeah like the rebels come come in, come into the story we get this bit where petora zoyes i think narrates this entire section and if you don't remember petora was in last light and uh, minor spoiler for this olivia stabs the fuck out of her yeah that is how petora comes to an end in last light but she's a not so good person shall we say but she's like watching this whole scene so she's there on behalf of uh gao She's trying to, this is basically the first time the different sort of like separate rebel leaders have started to come together to try and organize into like some sort of a loose coalition. Yeah, because they see weakness. They think the Covenant is a, the Covenant human war is a chance to strike up and in the, get themselves independent. We have this guy, I don't think we've had him before, uh, General Garvin. No, no, he's new, I think. He has come to this group and he seems to be new to everything, but he knows information. I think that he very quickly, like, 
wins the favor of a lot of them because he has intelligence from people in within the UNSC because they're the rebels at this stage like one of the cool thing they mentioned is some of them lived on harvest previously and they still think the attack on harvest was a cover to get the planet evacuated so that the UNSC could repopulate it with like friendly civilians some of the theories are pretty crazy out there but it, it shows I think it did a good job of showing the different factions of the insurrections have some of them are so radical some of them are so yeah zealot, and some of them are like more practical in terms of what, what they expect but uh at the, at the same time this scene is really weird uh, in this book it kind of sticks out a little bit in terms of it sets up all these characters that we never hear from again and introduces characters we know before that you think would be bigger especially like during this chapter they're all like one of the main people is captain castilla and they're like oh my gosh captain castilla she's so prestigious I heard that she was actually married to Preston Cole at one point, and she reveals that. And then the chapter ends, and we don't hear from her again. Yeah. I was yeah. thinking she was going to be a huge player, and Cole was going to come back into the picture. Me too. But then again, I suppose this is the stage where Cole... This is the point where Cole still thought she was dead. This is after she, like, fakes the the destruction of the of our ship, uh, the Bellicose. The Bellicose, Yeah. So I think this is after that stage. So like he still doesn't know that she's back on the scene yet until much later. By the way, can we go... Uh, you mentioned earlier the crazy theories they have. I like the one theory where they're talking about, you know, it's a... Uh, what is it that he, they're... That they found a race of friendly aliens that the UNSC are trying to like wipe out, and the other one is like, yeah, and there's also this theory that like a, a group of evil AIs have turned against humanity, and you're just like, oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny. But yeah, it's it's like it's a slightly weird scene. They 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 have a chat and a talk, and they're not really into the idea of the covenant but then they come around to the idea of like we'll play both sides and we'll see if we can trust the covenant and we'll supply them with intel and maybe they'll wipe out the unsc and if they don't wipe out the unsc well then you know they've weakened them yeah i thought this was like it it was difficult to read from the point of view that we all know the covenant so well and we all know that like, like, everything they talk about is stupid. Because we know, obviously, the other sides of the stories haven't read the other books and just being a reader, I suppose. But, like, it just seems, like, so stupid. Like, reading it going, like, none of this is actually going to happen. You're catching all these plans and theories that are ridiculous. And that, like, there's no way this is going to work. And then, of course, you go to the other side, which we'll talk about in a minute, of, like, when we get to see the Covenant side of the story and exactly what you think is happening is happening where they're just like, yeah, take the information and kill them all. And even during this meeting, one person says it, because I think it's Garvin that uh, says, oh no, we can talk to them in English, because they they made a message in English at Reach, where it's like, you know, your your destruction is the will of the gods, and we are their instrument, and one person pipes up and be like, yeah, yeah, they really sound like they're up for an alliance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. While we're just here before we go on, when they talk about the other Spartan teams that are on Jericho 7, is Jericho 7 the planet they nuked? Or is that... I know that's the planet in Fall of Reach. Jericho 7 is, I want to say, that's where they get the weird artifact and where Cortana gets the coordinates for the Halo oh. from. I, th- I want to say that's Jericho 7, but Jericho 7... The name you see got in my way, because isn't there a planet that the UNSC nuked mid-rebellion? What do you mean by nuked? Is, am I nuked f- a rebellion? Am I forgetting... Am I getting that wrong, or am I mixing up different sci-fi? But I thought there was a planet that was sort of mid-insurgents, and it was the only time the UNSC used nukes on a colony. Jericho 7 is a lightly populated human colony world located in the Lamba Central Section, where it contains a wide for human life... In 2525, Spartan twos were dispatched to Jericho to suppress rebel factions on the planet. Around the same time, ODST troopers were sent to put down insurrection forces and remained at Jericho for over 141 days. These are, this Jericho 7 is in the Fall of Reach, it's in Flood, it's in Isle of Bees, it's in Ghost of Onyx, it's Forward Unto Dawn, it's in Halo 5. Right, it's, it's been everywhere. mentioned a lot. Wow. It's Silent Storm. Yeah, it's been in a lot of references. The planet was glassed via orbital bombardment in the final stages of the Battle of Jericho in 2525. Yeah. At the end of the battle, John asked Captain de Blanc for permission to watch and Jericho being glassed. A large number of orphans from this planet enlisted in the Spartan 3 program. That's where it comes so into play. 
Mm. Right. That was in my memory for some reason. But the the end result of this little group is they decide they're going to get in touch with the Covenant. So they send a messenger off to like see can they pass information on because the insurrectionists seem to be aware of the Covenant doing recon of planets before they invade. That's another cool point, yeah, that I, I liked about this. It's one of the silent shadow. That's what I like as well, that um, straight away you see that the Covenant are not as clever as they think they are and that you're not as subtle as they think they are and these super elite stealth soldiers are like out being outsmarted and cleverly identified by the insurrection yeah. guys. And I thought that was cool. I also really liked, because we haven't touched on it that much. I mean, I don't think even Harvest went into that much of how the Covenant didn't just stumble onto humanity. They were actually studying us for yes. a period of time. And they've they've learned a lot of terms of our languages and terms of our even our slang words. And they understand a lot more, a little way more than we actually thought. And I, I thought that was really, I liked seeing, I liked seeing the silent shadows. I liked seeing these stealth scouts, essentially. I thought that was cool. I liked hearing more about them. They do that. And then the other thing they do is they decide that they need to overthrow the government in Biko so that when the Covenant arrive, they're ready to negotiate with them. So they decide that there's a good quarry on the moon of Sioba that will be perfect for a staging point to lead the coup. Uh, and then that takes us back to the planning on Task Force Yama, where they are also going, oh, and there's a disused quarry on this moon Seoba that will be perfect for <laughs> us to wait for the Covenant to come and invade Biko. I think it starts off then that when you get back to Chief, they're in the, a drop bay ready to do a practice invasion run of Seoba just to get some practice. And then at the last minute, a call comes out from Colonel Crowther basically saying, no, no, this is no longer a drill. This is real. There are people there. And then as soon as the drop bay opens, everyone gets splattered and it all, the shit sort of hits the fan. Oh, it's so cool. You can pretty much break this book up into like four major set pieces. So this is like the second one. And it's just like everything that takes place on this moon is so cool. Like it's so unique. Just the environment is so unique. The problems they guys encounter and how they get around it is so unique. I love, I love it. It's just so cool. Yeah, because they're in like this light gravity environment because Chief's answer as the ships are pulling up out of orbit is to step off the ramp and drop down to the planet with a rocket launcher or drop down to the moon and so take some people cool. out. And like yeah, it was so cool. He kind of jumps the gun and then everyone else is forced along with him. And like there's a little bit of arguing later and uh it's the what do we call her? Nelly Lieutenant Ham. Mm, she's a cool character. She's not too pleased with Chief at the end of this because Chief basically jumps the gun ahead of her and starts the invasion. And I think they lose like 200 casualties during this whole thing. Yeah, they lose a lot. They lose a lot. That isn't really John's fault. I wouldn't blame him for that. And I know he, he he does jump the gun and forces other people's, the hand of other people. But like in the middle of it, like a lot of these parallels are getting shot down means there's a lot of people dying already dead because they dropped and had no choice into like a kill zone because spoilers there's an insurrectionist spy in this group who's who fed the insurrectionists their location so they were ready and waiting well they were they were waiting for the covenant like they were also waiting for the covenant they didn't expect the UNSC to land on top of them because this is kind of the discussion that chief and johnson have during this is like they were prepared and then Chief turns around and goes, but they weren't prepared for us because they would have left. Like, they wouldn't have stayed. They, I think they That's suffer. Right, yeah, like, it makes sense. They suffer full casualties. But the end result of this is the UNSC basically capture everyone, including General Garvin. And they load them onto a freighter to get them shipped back to the UNSC. Beagle. Oh, they're, oh, yes, they're going to ship them back to Beagle, except for General Garvin, who they're taking back to the UNSC with them. And then the Covenant land... Yep, and then the Covenant show up. Yes, that's always the the bad part, but there's a little interaction with... uh, I suppose we didn't mention the first Covenant section, did we, just before we get into this? Because there's a little bit before where we're introduced to uh, Fleet Master Master Cavarossi. So he's like the guy in charge. There's the Minor Minister of Artifact Survey. He's the bureaucrat in charge. He's the asshole. (laughs) Yeah, there's... Tell Zadali, who is the first blade of the Silent Shadow, he's like the elite special forces guy. So, like, they're introduced in the first section where they're 
talking about invading the next planet and they have a, he has a little the fleet master has a little interaction with minor minister where they basically set off a super volcano on the planet they're glassing and then move on they've wiped out the planet's only spaceport so they set off the super volcano and like slowly freeze to death all the humans left on the planet because they didn't want to spend another year glassing all the little villages. They go on anyway, and then as they're invading Biko, the first blade is looking out the front window of the ship, and he can see little black spots taking off on, from the moon. And he's like, what are these? And then they go to the sensor operator, and he's like, no, there's nothing there. I love that. They have this horrifying realisation where the shipmaster realises it at the same, t- slightly after tell, where it's like, Oh god, the humans have better stealth ships than us. Yeah. I loved this sequence. I thought it was so well written of just the complacency and just the overconfidence of the covenant just comes crashing around this fleet master who just can't see it. Just can't you know, just can't his brain won't fit. Like the I love the silent the silent storm what's that silent storm god? The, the silent shadow. The shadow? Silent Shadow, how he's just like, he's been studying the humans, so like, he accepts things and reads the situations very cleverly, but because the Fleet Master distrusts him, and so does the Prophet, they just, they don't in their, they don't have him in their, their discussions, which leads to a lot of errors on their part, which I just think is hilarious, but like, the idea that he sees it with his own eyes, and, and then, but they're, their sensors aren't picking them up because their prowlers are so good. I thought that was so cool. I loved that idea, that concept. It was interesting how kind of the opposite happened. Like we wanted human humanity wanted to capture Covenant tech, and now the Covenant wants to capture some human tech yeah. to figure it out. Also, yeah. it was really interesting to see um, the San Shyam inter- uh, survey interacting with the elites and how much the elites absolutely hate him. <laughs> They're like, get yeah. this guy off my ship. Oh my gosh. Even during the the first introduction to the Covenant in this bit, the fleet master was sitting at one point and he's like, I could kill you. And I was like, no, that's that's a heretical thought. Don't think it. Like That's, that's inappropriate. <laughs> but time and time again, it comes back to... The other thing he mentions is the Silent Shadow are basically... They're also sent out to like remove Covenant high-ranking Covenant commanders from positions when the Hierarchs decide they, they've like fucked up enough. And he's like, I wonder if the Silent Shadow ever killed a prophet. Hmm. Like just time yeah. and time again, this comes up where he's just like... I could kill you. Because when they, they get the message from the, the rebels at one point, they don't wait for the minister's translation device. They go on without him, even though the minister's furious and is just kind of like, fuck you. Yeah. It's like, we're, we're doing this yeah. without you. It's it's really interesting how the elites don't like the political aspect of the covenant. They hate it. They just want to fight. Yeah. Whereas all the prophets are interested in is like politicking and getting further along up the food chain yeah pretty much it's it's yeah it's cool it's interesting to see that there are cracks in the armor from the inside i always like that about the covenant and um i did i just think it's cool the end result of this attack on seoba is basically that uh halima ascot gets taken out so the task force is kind of in a little bit of a power vacuum where it's Crowther and this other lieutenant commander were introduced called Nayedo. Who Nayedo originally seems like the nice guy. He's on John's side when Crowther is against him. He's too nice. Yeah, he is he's quite, way yeah, too he nice. is a little too nice. He says to John at one point, he's like, Well, you know why Crowther's putting the Spartans in the back of everything? It's like because he doesn't want his black daggers to be shown up. And John's like, No. No one would do that because John, God, he's kind of naive and innocent in this. Because at one point, I think Johnson says to him something about, You've never seen a, a senior officer screw up a mission by letting a secret slip. And John thinks to himself, I've never seen that happen before. Whereas Johnson's been around for a while, so he's seen shit go wrong. And, yeah. like, uh, Naito uses this to his advantage and kind of tries to befriend John, although Halsey seems to have him figured out pretty quickly. Because yeah, multiple times Halsey steps in to like shield John and from Johnson. This, and Johnson seems to Johnson have it too. But during all of this, uh, we eventually find out that Naito possibly could be a bad guy, a spy. Because after this attack, they plan that 
they ta- they capture some Covenant equipment, they figure out where the Covenant supply base is, and they decide they're going to go and attack it. And they come up with an attack strategy, but they also find that the ship is bugged, um, and that Naito has been spying on them, but they can't prove that Naito is a spy for the insurrection at this stage. But there's various things that they notice that he didn't do things right. Yeah. And that, like, for example, he could have come to John's rescue on Seoba sooner, but didn't. Everybody, but that's where he kind of showed his hand in terms of everybody's like, yeah. you could have killed all of the Covenant ships in one run, but you took way longer than necessary. You're obviously trying to get the Spartans killed. And also and the kind of figures chatter, it out. chatter in the first couple Yes, because that also comes back. He reveals that that was someone in his... Uh, He's in charge of Ghost Flight, that's uh, three prowlers, and it was one of his officers on a prowler that accidentally put the message out on Team Com as well. So you start to see like a pattern, but even at this stage, John's like, these are just coincidences. Like, that's not enough to prove that he's that he's definitely someone we need to take out or take down. While we're talking about the bugs, do we want to talk about Seductive Halsey? <laughs> oh, yeah. That was cool. <laughs> that was so funny. Yeah. We now have the return of Sexy Halsey, everybody. Sexy Halsey is back. We Last we saw her, she was um, in the anime series Halo Legends, and now she is back. This, is, this isn't this is Sexy Halsey, this is Milf Halsey, because she She's makes a point a of being daughter. like, I've, I've had a one-year-old, True. but I've still got it. And yeah. she calls Crowther to her quarters. There's a whole little like seduction scene that ends when they're safely in the back room. I love how he plays along with it. It's pretty funny. It's just he's no clue what's going on, but he he figures it out. He slowly please. figures it out, and I think at one stage he has a line like, "But but Catherine, you're so much younger than me. What do you find in an old man like me?" And she's like, <laughs> "Experience." And he's like, "It's like oh well, hot yeah. damn." <laughs> and I think she says something like, "You you know what you're doing." He's like, "Well, I am infantry," and he follows her off yeah. into the back kitchen. It was really funny. Once they got in here, she's like, "Can I get you anything?" He's like, "I need a glass of water, cold glass cold of water. water. Cool I need down. to calm down." Yeah, it was pretty cool. I, I, it's there's just so many different things in this. Area, but I think the uh, when they're not in combat, I'm finding the dialogue so intriguing. Uh, I love the interaction between the main characters and the political intrigue going on in, the, in within the task force. I think it's pretty cool. Well, and Troy is so good at writing characters and writing characters exactly how you expect them to be written i don't think he makes any missteps with these characters that already that we've seen so many times time and time again he's still able to stay pretty true to exactly how the characters would act and what they would actually do yeah and i think he's also great at coming up with his own unique characters that interact very well with the established ones so like there's just loads of, and like any halo novel there's a lot of dead people by the end of it there are it's pretty damn cool and i'd say them well, like after so but like you said they have this Halsey they get this technology Halsey figured out it's kind of a star map and they can kind of backtrace Covenant kind of routes through space slip space and figure out where they came from Um, I liked how she figured that out I thought that was well logically it, it worked out well it, like it makes sense they find the munitions fleet and they destroy the munitions fleet and then Halsey uses the star map to see where the new resupply fleet comes from and she then figures out this is the supply base. Also I have to say that was that was a really, really damn cool sequence of these big massive ships collecting this gas and that that gas is then used to create the plasma. Yeah, I, I, that was cool. I never That's thought of where the Covenant plasma came from. No, me neither. And that it's not. I like. The, I like the way that you feel. Like it's not infinite. It is ammunition, and that like it costs so much to glass a planet, that like they really have to think about it. And I liked. I love the conversation between the minister where he's trying to get, uh, the fleet master you need to kill humans faster. It needs to be a more efficient way to kill the humans because we're wasting so much time and resources doing this, and so like. That's when they set off the volcano and it's like it'll kill them slower. But the minister was really impressed that like he could do this and make the humans to suffer. Like, And I think we it's kind of around this point where they're at Biko and the Covenant wipe out Biko. Clearly, they, they just do. I don't think they wipe out Biko at this stage because I think they drive them. They kind of drive them back. It's a smaller fleet at this stage. I think they do eventually wipe out Biko. But they do because it's, they were, they it's were around the same right? time that like yeah it's around the same time that task force yama goes to take out that force the logistics force 
the, where the carrier are, are collecting the gas, that's when Beko is being wiped out. So like the Covenant essentially they fire at Beko and they didn't realize what happened, but they actually set the atmosphere on fire. Oh, that's right. And like that was really cool. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh shit, that's that's hardcore. I forgot about the atmosphere on fire. That was the cool conversation about like this fleet's been wiped out and we're running low on ammo. But we can't show the humans that we're running low on ammo, so we still have to use the ammo yes. while pretending we don't have it. And I was like, oh, that's such an interesting dynamic of, like, you have to think about these things. It's really interesting to see Covenant logistics, because we don't see that at all in any of the Halo media, really. We don't see them needing more resupplies. What was the unyielding Hierophant? That's about the only time I think we've ever really had it mentioned was that was like a that was a resupply station. Yeah. In first strike like that, but like they don't mention it very often and you don't think about I I suppose you don't really think about Covenant lines because you just assume the Covenant dart about everywhere and it's all like instant but it's not like they're leapfrogging from planet to planet and they leave the resupply fleet at the last planet they get who they glassed to suck up the atmosphere to make the plasma while the attack fleet goes mm-hmm. on to the next one and this is the shipmaster's plan is attack Beko, try and save the shipyards use it as a staging post to attack further into human space meanwhile the human fleet has gone the other direction to go and hit his resupply point and they come up with a plan to basically strike the planet quick and take out its protection fleets and then attack the the planet's surrounded by a big space station ring what do we call it here the ring of where is it the ring of mighty the ring of mighty abundance yes yes and uh, the covenant have some weird names for things they do but it's kind of fun I do need a covenant name generator. So they go to attack this place, but they also give... uh, They change their invasion plan slightly so that when they get there, uh, Commander Nieto doesn't have all the information he needs. When they get into the system, he goes to ping Blue Team's fleet. And to, inverted commas, accidentally reveal their conversation. Yes, location. to accidentally reveal their conversation, or reveal their position. And Johnson and Crowther are on his bridge. And Naito can tell something's up, but he hasn't figured out quite what it is yet. And as soon as he crosses the line, Crowther steps in to be like, No, I'm relieving you from command. You're trying to endanger the Spartans on purpose, and Naito just f- is it Naito he or the Helmsman just up. fucks him up. It's the Helmsman. It's the operator who literally just fucking kills Crowder point blank to the head, and I'm like, shit. Yep, all of them it turns out are armed. So Johnson tries to take out Naito, but he doesn't. Uh, spoiler for later, you might remember the name Naito, and that's because eventually he will become the president of Gao. Oh. No, it's not him. No, it's yeah, yes. It's, that's no, it's that's who him. he is. No. Oh yeah. Is that no? Is that his he cover was, name? No, he was the president of Gao. I think by the time we're on Gao and Last Light, that's he's er- deceased. Er- Castile. No, no, no. He was the president later. The president before him was Hector no Nieto. Way. Hector Nieto was the president. And also another fun fact while we're on the subject, uh, because eventually... No, this is his first appearance. No, no, he's only mentioned. He's he's not actually... He's not a character in Last Light. He's just mentioned. Human Nieto is a human politician and general in the Elder Colony of Go. Yes. Oh, and here's another fun fact. Uh, in Retribution, you know the guy at the start in the bar that Blue Team and the ferrets have come to arrest the smuggler that they're trying to get off the planet with? Yes. That's Nieto's son. Oh. He has the Prowlers. Shit, he still has the Prowlers? Oh, because Nieto stole yes, them. Yes, oh because Nieto God. stole the Prowlers. So he awesome. used the Prowlers to gain Gao's independence. Oh, Troy, you sly yes, devil. Yes, he became president. Devil, How are we supposed to follow all this? <laughs> I, I spent a lot of time putting brackets on the end of character names here because I had to remember all this in my head. So, yes, there's a whole through line to the rest of the books, but that's what happens. Eventually, Hector Nieto gets away. Um, I think Johnson tries to take the Prowler, but at the last minute, as they're about to blow the the bulkhead to the bridge, they vent the ship they and all of the ODSTs get spaced, but they're all in their vac armor, so no one dies. Johnson decides his only way to save the mission is to set off his like distress beacon so that the Covenant hear it and the Covenant come out. They don't know the Prowlers are there, 
but the Covenant come out to the signal and then they chase the Prowlers off. I thought that was cool. That was I really thought, cool. Um, that whole sequence was great where you realised that Naito knew he had was betrayed. This, well, knew that knew he was instigating his own plan straight away. So, like, when Johnson was on the bridge, he had already vacked all the ODSTs out. And that he'd given, like, a secret signal to, like, his officer when he was saying, ping the ping blue team. Oh, and he yes. did, like, a weird tap, tap on his chair. That tap was a signal to... Vent the ship, because he says, send the burst transmission, and Johnson even says, the, like, a line, like, it felt like the ship shuddered in response to his order. Yeah. And he doesn't realize yeah. that that's the point where the ODSTs have all been flushed out. Yeah, and but it's, it's cool that, like, you know, Johnson does a retreat from the bridge, shooting, like, dual-wielding magnums and like you know kills a bunch of them falls back kills a couple of more people that come out come on the bridge and because at this point they're they're stunned that like Nieto isn't just one insurrectionist that it is in fact his whole crew they actually yeah. they, this is when they come to the conclusion and realize oh shit he's managed to get the crews on all three ships full of yeah, sympathizers and then, of course Oh, because all these are badasses some of them manage to hold on and not get fact so they fight their way to the bridge and there's only like six of them or some shit, and they're about to take their bridge back before they get like vacked out again. I just thought that whole sequence was really good, cool. and then the exchange between I think it's Ham and like uh, Johnson, where she's like, "Oh, how many are left?" and he's like, two. and she's like, "What?" He's like, "Yeah, I killed like eight people on the way back fighting my retreat back here," and she's like, "Holy shit, it's pretty <laughs> awesome." I think there's something she says is like not too bad for an old guy. It's something like that, yeah, basically. Yeah, something like that. And then I like the last bit before they get back from the ship where Johnson's there and they're putting the explosives on the door and he just happens to look up at the wall and he goes like, oh, fuck, camera. And then that's the moment yeah. at the ship fence and they all get flushed. But anyway, Naito is out of the scene at this stage. Meanwhile, blue team, they go to try and board the ring of plenty or the ring of mighty abundance you've got me saying the ring of plenty now they try to board it but the covenant seem to have been tipped off and they keep all their defenses close to the ring so they come up with plan b where they get the prowlers to drop them off on the planet and they're going to take like an orbital grav lift which Mm -hmm. i i never thought about grav lifts being like up to orbit i always figured they were to get to a ship to the ground but they have these massive orbital gravel. They're lifts. pretty much space elevators, yeah. which we've seen in Halo Universe before. So it's just the Covenant version of a space elevator. I suppose I just never thought about the Covenant needing a space elevator. It well, seems we like really a very human tech. thought about the Covenant tech. needing resupplies like this. It's, it's the logistics, so yeah, which is, which is is cool. But I found, did you find like this difficult to kind of image to see it in your head? Because they describe it as two planets, like a planet and a moon that are in a unique orbit and that because of the orbit there's a space in between them that you can park something and then that's where they built the ring but the ring is also connected to the ground via all these space elevators the way i pictured it was there were three parking places and that's where the defense fleets were but the ring goes around the planet kind of like around the equator and then the grav lifts are the spokes but it's in full orbit of the planet because halsey's plan is is it full orbit of the planet i i thought it was like its own little thing that's what i thought as well the way i pictured it was it was like a wheel around the planet because they have to destroy 10 sections so that enough of the ring is destabilized that it collapses in on itself and lands on the planet the only reason why i didn't think it was that is that john could see all of it from his place yeah so he couldn't see all around the planet, but he could see to the other side of the facility where Green Team was destroying their facilities. Yeah, but I got the feeling that that wasn't like the whole way around the ring. But you think about it like for the size of a planet, if like even if you see a picture and you're in orbit of a planet, you can see a good chunk around the circumference of a planet. So I just figured he could he could see his section the of the ring. The because the thing is, as they move across their sections of the ring, there's a berthed supercarrier being constructed and it comes into view. But like that wasn't in view originally. So I was just thinking it was hidden by the hangar. Me too. I just thought it was hidden by the structures because it just didn't make sense in terms of they need to destroy 10 structures. 10 structures around the place of an entire planet. That's not enough. But I, I assume the way I sort of thought of it was it was 10 sections around this ring that were enough to destabilize it that it would fall in on itself. 
because I got the impression that because it was a ring, it couldn't fall out of orbit because it's a solid structure, you know, the whole way around a planet. But if the structure's as big as a planet, the operation they did wasn't that long. It was only a couple of minutes that they were actually on it. How fast were those vehicles they were using going to go around the entire planet? Not that fast. I think it's a big-ass structure. I just didn't get the impression it was going around the equator in terms of it was just a big ass fucking ring of a space station in space what i'm sensing here is the planet. we're going to have to get in touch with the sins of the prophets guys damn it that's a good idea yeah that's a good idea and we're going to have okay. to ask or them even, for their opinions even the guy who wrote the fucking thing mm, we could do that too but i i get the feeling sometimes that. that he could turn around and say this was a 343 creation nothing yeah but nothing he has to know enough about the structure. facility in order to write it yeah totally Anyhow. Whatever way it works, they destroy their sections and the ring collapses. But before they destroy their sections and take everything out, there is a showdown between... They lose an awful lot of people, by the way. Uh, they lose almost lose, all the ODSTs. We lose Nelly Ham. The ODSTs in, uh, that are that make it onto this, the platform with them from the planet end up eventually getting taken out and they sacrifice themselves with one of their bombs. Blue team make it to the ship whose name... Like, Hammer, Hammer of Faith, I think, is the name of the ship that's under construction, which, by the way great name for a covenant ship hammer of faith i like that one it's a covenant super carrier isn't it yeah i love the i just love well just the fact that like there's gold gold and green team are off site at the moment like they have this like john comes up with this crazy plan at the last minute of we're going to drop down come up this grab lift and just figure it out and it's just like things go haywire from like the very start so i thought it was really really cool just not knowing what ha- was happening to the other teams, but just seeing John's like looking across the facility and just seeing, okay, yes, green team have made. He just assumed, you no, know, Kurt would do it. Kurt would figure it out. He'd get there, and just to see the 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 actual conclusion of that, of just like, oh yeah, there's no way blue team can destroy all these enough you know, facilities. We're not going to get it done. And then you just see green team's side just fucking collapsing, and you're like, yes, it's just a, it's a cool moment of right. We only need to do one more. In order to do that, more ODSTs have to die. Yeah, all the ODSTs die. Um, they get first names, and some of them don't get named. And I think they said they retrieved something like six or seven ODSTs in total from this operation that survived. Yeah, and like the the other thing is the Covenant mentioned how they they find it very hard to interrogate the humans because they laugh lots, and like they they clearly they don't fear the Covenant. In this sequence, yeah, because they mentioned previously torturing the humans oh God. And, and the insurrectionists yes. yeah. to get the information, and it's like that's pretty hardcore. But I like, I like that their mind melders, whatever they're tried and tested, doesn't work on humans, or that the humans are tor- torturing, i.e., ODSTs, are just not breaking. And I think they even torture. Do they? What? What you say his name was the the insurrectionist leader who was leading all this? Gavin or whatever. Gav- yeah, Gavin, they captured him. Yeah, they do. I thought they, they did. They captured the a ship. transport that he was on that John oh. sends to Biko. And, and that's there's like a weird scene of the um, where we're introduced to those two brutes. Well, I think they negotiated, but I thought they let them away. No, they kept them because they no, tortured killed, them and killed all them of them. To get information and whatnot. They didn't, they didn't let set them out at all. So one thing for the end of this book... Because, um, you know, they destroy the ring and then they're back on the ship. Did all of the ODSTs have the nukes armed? So when they were getting tortured, that then their stuff blew up? That's what I think that's what they were laughing. Okay, that's what I thought too, but I wasn't quite sure. Yeah, I think it was a mix of that and the fact that they knew their mission was successful at that stage. That these captured out. I love, love the idea that like um, the Spartans are still a myth even to the Covenant. And like they have this guy set out to hunt them down but the minister is still like not sure they're even real and doesn't even believe that they're that they exist and it's just believing that it's the incompetence of the people around him more so than it's the humans are good enough to be able to do this to ever pull this mission off well he was so delusional too he thought they were going to go straight for high charity strike high charity which i thought was pretty hilarious the guy was an idiot though all the rumors about the Spartans, like even the insurrectionists, when they're talking about it, and they're like, "There's maybe a bit, like there has to be maybe a battalion of Spartans," and you're like, and they're going like, 
like there couldn't be more than 3,000 of them because we'd know about it and you're like fuck 3,000 Spartan 2s the war would have been over in about a week and a half yeah oh it's mad but it's also super super awesome I thought the sequence where the insurrectionists give the Mjolnir plans to the Covenant and they um the silent storm not silent storm goddamn silent shadow he looks over the plans and was like holy fucking shit these guys are awesome this is better than Covenant technology. This is impressive. I thought that was just a cool, cool moment. Once again, setting up how awesome the Spartans are and how clever humanity can be. Last two things I want to talk about because we're running long on this one because we've kept talking. Oh, yeah. Oh, two yeah, things I want to yeah. say. First off, the name dropping of the two brutes, Castor and Orsum. That's the only time I think name dropping got a little too severe in this because I, f- I kind of feel like we could have done without Castor and Orsum being the two brutes because they didn't really serve enough of a purpose in the story. They barely talked. They drank, They were kind of just there. They didn't really Yeah, like do the, the, the only mention brutes. of them is that they interrogated some humans by playing a game of tossers, which, by the way, <laughs> that's awful. The idea that they pluck your arms and legs off and then throw them about the room and leave the rest of the people to look after the crippled ones, that's horrible. That is horrible. I think that's not the first time they've mentioned that. I think that's in the that's in that short evolution story where the the brutes are torturing people on the planet. I think they mentioned Humans. tossers yeah, there first. Pointing them down. I don't know if they say it like that, but they're definitely playing with human body parts in, in that story. Brutes um, are gross. There's also I guess I didn't realise it, but obviously Troy has input has input all of his characters more or less into this story. Like there's a lot of tie backs to the characters of Retribution. Which I didn't really, and, and lastly, and you know, all the Gao, that Gao storyline, he's obviously setting up all those characters as well, which I never copped. Yeah. You have, you know, Arlo Castillo has mentioned, Gao was mentioned a few times. You have Pretoria, like you said earlier on, and then you have Arsun, and. They mentioned Venezia and stuff as well, and. Yeah. Like they go all through I mean, all of it. That's the Halo universe. Last sort of thing, I think, before we do like the the final scene in this, uh, tell Zadali, the first blade. His fight scene with John was not as impressive as I was expecting. Yeah. Well, okay, to be fair, it was impressive for John, but it was not an impressive show of force for an elite. Well, he was definitely, he wasn't, at this point, the elites don't consider humanity at all equal to them. I think if he did, he would have started with the energy sword and not the plasma rifle. But at the same time, I expected more out of him, given the fact that he had the Mjolnir plans and knew somewhat what to expect going in. That it's not just a human in armor; that it is a, that it's something more. I don't, I don't know. I thought I thought it was a good enough fight. I mean, I don't know. They, they didn't really have time to drag out the way the story was written. It True, like they're a on fight. a two minute countdown at this stage. But I just expected him to put up a little more of a. So it's got to be fast and brutal. I kind of yeah. honestly, I expected him to live. I think that's the thing. I expected him yeah, to be a character maybe. to go forward to do something else with. But more so, I, I, he intrigued me more than the fleet master did. So I, I thought it'd be him and not him shout out was, to bad. Castor and Orsoon who were the wisest covenant in all of this because they saw they saw Tel get taken out and their first thought was run for a banshee and flee and yeah. I approve of that <laughs> they're the most intelligent people out there in the covenant maybe so far the final scene of this the the UNSC win and the Spartans and Johnson and a few people sit and watch like they, they watch the planet collapse basically and the station collapse onto the planet they're having like a party <laughs> they're having a party and I think John's like this is a good party and he thinks to himself this <laughs> is like, the I've only party I've ever party. been to yeah I love how they're just super chill in these stealth ships totally confident they're untouchable watching the Covenant like fall apart yeah like the this base of reparations fall apart which I thought was awesome also the fact that they have all their weapons and all their music all, sorry all their explosives set to like a 60 minute dead man kind of switch of like after 60 minutes and this thing's active if it's not deactivated it automatically blows up and that you'd imagine it doesn't talk about that much but i imagine that because you only see it from john's side from so far away but obviously that wreaks havoc on that covenant fleet oh yeah oh yeah it's got to make an absolute mess of everything and they must have thought that like this is the um thought that um or maybe interesting i never really kind of do you think the fleet master is dead do you think his ship got blown up? I don't up? know, because it felt like a lot of the prisoners were from the smaller transports. Yeah, okay. no, I, I think the Fleet Master's oh, alive because his that, final scene, I think, takes place after this, and this is the last part. 
I thought he, ma- yeah, you're. I think you're right. Yeah, he made a comment about about young captains, young elite captains wanting to like make their mark, so they're going to in- hold the prisoners and interrogate them on their own ships before giving them over to him. Yeah, yeah, and like I think his his little scene takes place after John's scene because he's standing on the bridge of the ship watching everything fall apart, but there's no party happening where he is. He's there and the minor minister appears and he's giving him a load of shit. And then his, I think it's his steward, Tam Lacosi. Yeah. It's like his second in command or something. Yeah, he comes in and he's telling him like, uh, the first blade's dead, uh, Castor nor soon reported back, they saw him get taken out. And the minor minister's just going on and on going by like, oh, well, I assume if the two brutes saw, saw the Spartans kill him, that they've killed a Spartan and taken the body back with him. They go, no, no, they fleed. And it's like, oh, well, of course it would be too much to hope the two brute battle chieftains or two brute battle masters would think for themselves. And he's just going on and on and on. Then he gets click clacked. They just mentioned hmm. there's a there's a flash of blue light and the minister's head lands in his lap and the two elites step back and the Hover the shirt. steward hands his sword over to the shipmaster and he's like, you know, you can do this and the shipmaster's like, No, no, it's it's fine. It's fine. It's okay. We'll just we'll cover it up. <laughs> like, oh, we'll just tell him that Daddy died. Incinerate the body. He got so into the whole attack that he led the defense and died during it. And you're just like, That sounds like no profit ever. Yeah, but whatever <laughs> which does show at least that the elites know how to play the game of politics better than they like to admit yeah that wraps us up does it like i think overall what do we think pretty much i love it having read most of it yesterday i really liked this book way more than i thought i did i loved i loved how small it was i liked the small halo stories this had a lot of characters but kept it relatively small we had three maybe four locations it's one fleet together doing different things. There's cool set pieces, cool interactions with the characters. I loved everything new that was added. Um, Aaron, you were spot on with saying, why can't we have grenade launchers? I want grenade launchers on my weapons. Yes. Yes, They're Chief so makes cool. so cool in awful this. good use of it. So funny note, I went looking in about like, why don't we have grenade launchers? Where is grenade launchers? So the grenade launcher trivia is as follows. This is weapon attachment. The M301 wasn't confirmed as a weapon attachment until the release of the Hellbringer action figure. So the Hellbringers are from Halo Wars and they're the flamethrower troops. And their action figure is the one that introduced a gren- under slung grenade launcher, which I thought was ridiculous. That that's where it came from. Um, but it wasn't in any of the previously seen artwork. And I just think that's cool. I said I really, really want it. it was a re- apparently, it was originally meant to be part of the MA5B which is the normal assault rifle during the development of Halo Combat Evolved, but it was cut out. Supposedly it was in debatable mention by Bungie in the description of the weapon. I don't know, it's crazy. Yeah, I think it would be cool. Like, I know people will probably complain that it's not a Halo weapon, but fuck it. John uses it a lot. Everyone's using it a lot. Like, during the whole Sioba thing, one. like, they're launching grenades up the side of a mountain flat out. Everyone's using them. Everyone's got them. It seems like it's a no-brainer. Yeah. Shout out to awesome sequence of John and Blue Team and Johnson infiltrating via Banshees and just how that whole sequence was. I thought it was cool. I thought it was awesome sneaking into a squadron of Banshees, pretending to be part of them in their formation and then having to like EVA out of them and just kind of drop the Banshees and float in space a little bit and use our thrusters to engage the um, the carrier gas carrier ships oh, it's just so cool so many just awesome little sequences in this in this book yeah i definitely have to agree like it's it's a very fun book and it's a book i liked a lot well i suppose by the fact i listened to it three times <laughs> that's crazy you're crazy I, I, i'll have to read it now when i get my paper version but uh, i went all in on the audiobooks so and it's definitely it's given me some more faith in more prequel novels in a way that I kind of didn't have before because yeah, sometimes definitely. I like I said sometimes I think they're guilty of small Halo universe syndrome where characters meet each other and a lot happens but like everything in this like you said it all makes sense as to why they're there and what they're doing with the exception maybe of the brutes none of it felt too forced I really liked just I liked the setting and I liked how much John grows as a character during this and really becomes a leader. Also, shout out to the part where he actually becomes a Master Chief, 
We actually get to see oh, that. Oh shit, I totally forgot about that. Yeah, yes. that was so super Huge cool. Moment. Yeah, he gets a four rank promotion. Yeah, they really draw that out and the reason why he got it and I thought that was awesome. That really made sense. It was a that was a cool moment where um Crowther gives him that his promotion in in kind of secret and and then like has this secret plan that's totally hinging on the military following their ranks and just trusting that if he has that rank he has it for a reason. So therefore we we will follow the plan. And for the rest great. of the book they refer to him as Master Chief, which is nice. Yeah. Which basically makes sense as to why everyone knows he's Master Chief forever, because pretty much since the start of his like professional career, he's been Master Chief. I never got another promotion. Yeah, Poor I don't guy. think he can get another promotion. Spartans kind of became their own. Well, uh, I think they can go over the ranks, but because he's... I, now, don't get me on this, because American military is all a bit much, but I think because he's conscripted, he's limited in the ranks he can be, and Master Chief's as high as he can go without interference. I think as a conscripted man, you can go as high as Master Chief. I don't know. Everything above no that idea. is different. I, I want to say, they say that in Fall of Reach. I know they say that in Fall of Reach in the cartoon. Uh, you know, at one point he asks... Uh, Me- oh, Mendez? Mm-hmm. It is Mendez. He asks Mendez, yeah. what's the highest rank I can attain? He says, the highest rank is uh, for a conscripted man is Master Sergeant. Or Master Chief, Master Sergeant, and then and then he automatically just gets promoted straight to that. Yeah, like three years That's later. That's actually pretty hilarious. Yeah, but I just I really liked the setting. I really liked seeing the characters a little more naive, like Halsey and Chief and all those guys who, because they don't really know what they're doing. But really interesting, awesome characters as always. Good stuff. All right. Um, if you have any thoughts on podcast on Podcast Evolved, on Silent Storm, head over to the Facebook group or one of our many other locations. We're in Discord and numerous other places and drop some thoughts in with the guys. Uh, I think Ian has a spoiler chat in the Discord group. And yes. And we've been talking about it in the main group as well because a lot of people are picking up this book. Even I've noticed there's quite a few people in the group who have, are severely behind on books who have gone out and skipped the queue and read Silent Storm because of the praise they heard it getting from people. Well, it also makes sense because it's earlier in the timeline. Yeah. Because it's a prequel, you can go back and just enjoy it for what it is and like how it ties into stuff you've probably already read. So if you pop over there, you can have a conversation with all of us and let us know what you thought. I've been your host, Aaron. And I suppose until next time, Evolved? Evolved? Evolved. Evolved.